I hope it I hope it's working. So this is the first slide they told us to put on so that you can ask me questions. Um, but I hope you know that from the other uh, other talks. So let's start with my talk already. The original title was Five Elements of Software Architecture, but I had the talk a few times already, and five elements is quite a bit, quite a lot, especially because I like to talk about some of them uh, in quite long terms. So I had to prioritize, and uh, I'll tell you a lot about three elements, and try to dive into the fourth uh, uh, if, if, if I have time. If you want to have uh, questions or if you want to hear about the others, you can uh, visit us at the Ysoft stand where I can talk to you for another few hours before this, this conference ends. So this talk is a little bit more soft skilly than the others uh, around. And it's all about software architecture. Uh, I'll start with the obvious statement that software architecture is an interesting and very important thing to, to do and think about. Because every software system and every building has some sort of architecture. Some have uh, architecture that is managed, explicit, and well thought. Some like this, this is the ugliest museum in the world, somewhere in Canada. Some not so much. So that's why I want to tell you something about uh, software architecture. I'm, uh, my name is Martin Osowski. I'm a chief architect in a company called Vysoft. We have the stand there just next to the toilets. Uh, what we do is a software to manage printers. Uh, which sounds kind of boring, but it's actually a very complicated distributed system that can manage uh, thousands of printers along uh, great uh, geographic spans. So we've, we are really facing some uh, interesting technical challenges. And if you want to know more about them, uh, come, come and ask us at the stand. Uh, Maybe some of you don't know exactly where to put software architecture in the whole uh, product development. Okay. Does it? I like the hand microphone more. I feel like feels more like uh, like a movie star. Okay, so uh, let me give you uh, two famous met metaphors that are usually used for uh, software architecture, so that you can position it. In the, in the whole product life cycle. The first one is uh, the metaphor of a building. It's actually all about uh, oppositions between what architecture concerns itself about and uh, what is the rest. Here the metaphor is about rate of change and cost of change, putting architecture uh, at the end of the spectrum where we do decisions uh, that are really costly and uh, very difficult to change. and. Uh, also decisions that we don't make uh, that often. Like uh, when we do refinements, uh, product refinements, we do some architecture decision one in a few months. Uh, this, this metaphor is actually about a building in civil engineering that has layers. Uh, some of those layers can be changed uh, almost for free every day, like furniture in the rooms. Some of them can't be actually changed without uh, tearing down the building and changing what the building actually is. The other one is my favorite one. Uh, it's the city building metaphor because, uh, and, and here the opposition is between high level and low level details. Here, uh, this is actually uh, the center of Paris uh, as it was architected uh, in the second half of the, of the 19th century. It was a legacy city full of, with full of old buildings and sick people and they just uh, created a new architecture using these, uh, these departments and uh, boulevards and constraints on buildings so that uh, they took the old ancient city and with high level planning, they didn't tell uh, everybody how the buildings should look like, but what the overall city plan should be, they created modern uh, center of Paris. A very interesting uh, thing is this numbering of the departments in a spiral way. 
which is quite clever because if you are in the center of Paris, uh, you can very easily, even without the map, find the way to the river or outside, uh, outside of the city. So architecture is what is costly, uh, that what doesn't change very often. Yes. Thank you. Doesn't change very often and concerns itself with high level details only. Uh, so uh, I could go on and uh, show you other stuff, uh, other definitions, metaphors, oppositions, but I chose a different approach and I chose elements uh, that are important in, in so when doing software architecture and also elements that are interesting for me, that make architecture fun for me, that might make my heart sing. And uh, like I said, I had to prioritize a little. So I chose uh, listening, validation, and curiosity as the three uh, that I, I can probably uh, fit in the 40 or 50 minutes time. Uh, it's not that leadership or agility are not important. They are just uh, big topics, so I might uh, dive a little bit into leadership, but I'm not sure about, uh, about that. So let's start right with listening. Uh, and I'll start with a, with a story. Uh, it's uh, actually a very nice uh, TED talk by Ernesto Siroli about Italians who came to Africa to help Zambian people live better lives and have better food. Uh, there is a river called Zambezi and uh, it's a very fertile ground all around. And those Italians, they were very uh, surprised that th those people there didn't actually grow any tomatoes, any zucchini, nothing like that, even though they had a very fertile ground around. So they start teaching them, started teaching them. They paid them to show up and uh, help with the, with the crops being, uh, uh, being grown. And they were very reluctant, the Zambians, to come, but some of them came because uh, they, get, they got paid for it, so why not? And obviously, fertile ground made everything grow nicely, and uh, it came the time when they, had, uh, when they had the harvest just ahead of them. Everybody was excited about it. But just the night before the harvest, 200 hippos came out of the river, ate everything. And they asked the Zambians, uh, why didn't you tell us? Why didn't why, why did you left, let us do do this for several months without telling us this important detail? And they just said you didn't ask. So uh, Ernesto uh, Ciroli uh, has a, had a motto for his TED talk, and that's you want to help someone, shut up and listen. Uh, it's very important for me this one because we architects and. Uh, principal engineers and our engineers in general tend to uh, give people solutions and details and technologies and we are not so good in listening. So let me tell you who should we listen to, what should we listen for, and then uh, how, how it all fits together in my opinion and not only in my opinion. Uh, it's all about the people who we should, we, we should listen to are called in project management and also it's still falling down. Yeah, but I don't have... Okay, maybe I will... I don't have that much time. <laughs> so they're called stakeholders. Uh, someone calls them personas, but that's, uh, from my point of view, that's just a way of analyzing stakeholders and uh, empathizing with them. And uh, it will be a problem after all that the light is right here, but when you see the slides, you will see that uh, there are Twitter handles on some of these slides. Obviously not all of these ideas are my ideas. Most of them are ideas of other peop other people. Uh, so I hope you will get the slides to, to be able to follow the people who are mostly original uh, thinkers that had the ideas. So Tom Gilp, my favorite uh, product manager, architect, uh, computer scientist, uh, said that if you have less than 30 stakeholders to manage, to listen to, you don't have all of them. So what, where do they come from? Obviously, they come from the customer. Sometimes there is quite a lot more of, of, uh, of important stakeholders than the end user. 
because uh, there can be some security or law uh, constraints that you need to take into account. Uh, in our line of business, we are not selling the product uh, ourselves, but we use uh, partnerships with other companies. So we really need to listen to several roles in those companies too. And these are just some of them. And what uh, usually gets forgotten are our stakeholders from our own company. If you forget about your CEO, he will probably uh, come and uh, remind you. But uh, just a few people uh, use developers or other Q CSS, uh, QA engineers as important stakeholders in this context. But uh, if you don't have any developers or CSS uh, or, or support engineers, you can't really deliver anything. And what usually gets f totally forgotten is the law, meaning uh, GDPR and stuff like that, and the competition. Because stakeholder is anybody who can actually spoil or improve what you're doing. And you should be really careful about who you listen to and uh, who not. For that purpose, we use a matrix. It's just one of the uh, one of the options that can tell us how to actually uh, manage these stakeholders. It's it's basically these stakeholders are really important, so you have to have to manage them closely. These ones are it's it's a power uh, it's called power. Oh, this is not, not so good, power interest matrix. So the powerful and interested you should manage closely. The not so powerful but still interested, uh, you should keep informed. You should monitor, like the competition has low power and low interest probably, but you should monitor them closely to know what they're doing. And you should keep uh, the law and the lawyer, which is uh, high power, low interest, they don't care. Uh, you should keep them satisfied. So don't, uh, don't at least don't break the break the law. This is this sounds kind of uh, to, not so not so technical, but from my uh, my experience, it's very important, especially to be able to work uh, with these very well, and especially with the stakeholders uh, that are very powerful and very interested from the you know C level stakeholders of your company. Uh, some even say that uh, a good architect needs to be skilled in company politics to be able to uh, to do anything anything useful. And these people sometimes in some companies, not ours, uh, do do some politics. And it's not it's not only that. You should also know that it's very different. Uh, this, these stakeholders are in the different quadrants for different uh, di different products and different situations. So for example, we don't care that much about end user because we are doing, uh, we do care about end user, but not always because we are doing enterprise software. But customer service is very important for us because those are the people who make it uh, difficult or easy to maintain. And um, yeah, so, uh, those were the stakeholders, people you should listen to, and how you should listen to them. Here you can see the first slide with the Twitter handle. This is a, uh, this is a very interesting way of uh, actually analyzing the information you hear from them, uh, which gives everything in, uh, in the whole picture. It has actually three, uh, three layers. The first layer is the stakeholder layer, what you hear. The second layer is uh, the overall product la layer, which is uh, usually the domain of product managers, what you make of it and the terms of your product. And the third layer, uh, which is usually the domain of engineers and architects, is how you actually architect the system into subsystems and, uh, and other parts uh, so that everything makes sense and starts with the, uh, with the values and functions of, uh, of stakeholders and ends with some functioning system. If I zoom in a little, uh, there are actually uh, several axes in this picture uh, that are very important to distinguish. One of them is uh, the di to distinguish between values and functions. 
most of the time, uh, a lot of product managers and project managers do tend to uh, think that functions are the most important thing here. So the you know the list of functions and or features of the product, the long uh, the longer the list, the better. But with software architecture, as I will show later, uh, the other the other half is just as important. So functions is what the system does. Values or qualities, as you saw in the uh, in the last last slide, is how well the system actually actually does it. Another very important thing to distinguish is between what's requested, functions and values, and how it's actually delivered, how it's solved. So uh, solutions should be kept uh, apart from uh, from requirements, which is sometimes harder than it than it seems. There is also other dis uh, language distinct distinction, because when you are talking to the stakeholders, you should actually use uh, just the domain language, the problem language, and not talk about uh, your product that much. Whereas when you when you analyze the product, uh, you use the uh, you use the product language. I once sat a whole day with uh, with a partner of ours. Talking, asking them all sorts of questions about how they work without even saying the name of, of, uh, of our product because the whole, whole point was that I understood very well and in, in deep detail how they work and what problems they're solving and, and so on. So this is, uh, this is also very important. Good technique uh, to get to the bottom of what the stakeholders actually need is a five-wise technique. This is, uh, this is an example from Tom Gilp again. When uh, the stakeholders tend to tell you what solution they want delivered instead of what problems uh, they want solved. So they, they ask a password for security or secure password. And uh, if you ask them why, they, they are surprised. But you can ask further and get to the bottom of it and ask what, what sort of security they actually require. It, would be some, it will be something generic. So you ask them how much of security, and that's, that's a typical question with qualities and values. How much of it do you want? Because it's how well the product should do something. They tell you, some, if you are lucky, they tell you something very specific. And then you ask them if you can use this as a requirement and then find a proper solution for it. And in some cases they say yes, and in most, of, most cases they say no, because they uh, are as smart as you and they know how, how, how these problems should be solved. It once happened to us that we had to rewrite part of the product to implement a cipher that just uh, had, a diff lar uh, had a greater number in its name, although it was just two different algorithms, both with the same level of security. But there was, there was some security stakeholder at the customers, and they, they wasn't, wasn't very happy about 128. They wanted 256. And uh, we asked, we did all this stuff, and still we had to implement it the way they wanted. So it happens. Uh, it happens quite a lot, but we still should make the exercise and, and ask in more depth what they, what they want. Because our goal in the end is to deliver them uh, value, and value is basically uh, if we delivered or not delivered value to them, uh, they say, after they already got the product. So uh, if we just do what they want, they will just say, this is not what we needed, and uh, it will be our fault. It happens. This is my favorite. Uh, there is quite a lot of manifestos around product development. This is my favorite, favorite one. Whatever you do, whatever you use, whatever you focus on, it's always for one purpose, and that's to deliver value to the stakeholders. There is nothing like internal development, uh, infrastructure, whatever. Everything you do should be measured by how much value you can deliver or cannot deliver to your stakeholders. So the next element is validation. I can start with the story again. This is Clever Hans, a horse that uh, this other guy on the picture, called, uh, whose name is William van Osten, Ost thought. Uh, he thought he taught the horse to do arithmetics, to uh, answer difficult philosophical and historical questions. 
And everybody believed that because everybody saw with their own eyes that the guy just asked the question and the horse uh, tapped with, with, with its hoof, hoof and answered the question correctly. So, and everybody was kind of invested into believing that. Uh, and uh, it took a very brave uh, psychologist uh, whose name was uh, Oscar Pfangst, who did a series of very thoroughly thought te tests, like uh, someone else asks the question and everything else stays the same. Uh, the horse has uh, his eyes covered, uh, its eyes covered, and everyone else stays the same. Quite a lot of experiments like that, and they finally found out that uh, every, everybody who was asking the horse the questions uh, actually uh, unwillingly uh, did some gesture so the horse could find that uh, this is the right answer. Uh, after he did prove that, uh, everybody who believed in it, like 90% of people who believed in it, still believed in it. And the guy was very unpopular at that time. And there are still clever horses all around the world. Uh, and we also have a lot of clever horses in our architectures and, and software products. Someone had some clever idea, some clever design, and all, uh, if we don't do proper validation using engineering methods, everybody will just stick with the, with the idea and believe that uh, it's clever, although it doesn't bring any value, just like everybody thought that the horse was actually clever. So how do we do validation? Uh, we do validation by listening to the stakeholders, and having uh, good requirements uh, that can help us validate if the ideas are good and if the, if the product and design really brings, uh, brings value. Tom Gulp says that if you have good detailed requirements, you don't have to think about anything and uh, it's just a simple matter of implementation. Uh, like I said before, there are two types of requirements. One of them are usually by, considered by the business as more important. Those are functional requirements. You know, your Samsung phone has 100 functions, whereas iPhone has only 50 functions, and everybody is, uh, nobody can understand how, how, how come that the iPhone is better sold. Uh, but uh, here in this context, functional requirements are actually not as important as, uh, as, it, as it would seem. Uh, Tom Gilb has a great example of this, where uh, the function of this device is that I can, uh, if the camera wasn't there and I could really move freely, I could move freely around the room and just uh, move the slides without any necessary contact with the computer. And uh, you will see what I want to show you. And that's, that's just a function. But it's nothing new, because uh, uh, tens of years ago, Every school was equipped with such a device that also showed some pictures that I, uh, I would like to show. Uh, I would have liked to show you. I would just need to be there from time to time to change the slide. This is the original meaning of the word, or paper, or whatever, to, to show it to you. And even this is not nothing new, because what I could do is print a lot of printouts of my slides and just uh, distribute it, uh, or have some girls send, uh, or boys sending them to you, uh, it, would it would just be uh, a, little, a lot less convenient and it would just be, uh, you know, longer, slower, but still there is nothing new uh, in, in this device, there's nothing new in this, uh, it's, it was called Meotar, and it's, there's nothing new in, in drawing pictures. So Tom Gilb even says, functions are for free. You can put any function everywhere. You, uh, functions are just just say what your system is and what it isn't. If it is a phone or a car, but uh, basically there is nothing so interesting on them from the architecture and solution perspective. It's just that you know what you're building. So architecture is uh, more built on the other requirements. We call them quality requirements that are based on value of the stakeholders than, uh, than on the functions. Uh, here, there is quite a lot of terminology. Uh, a lot of people call these non-functional requirements, which, which is not so good because it says there are functional requirements, important ones, and there are, then there are some non-functional requirements if you need them. If not, uh, it's all okay. 
or it, it even sounds like uh, they don't function. So uh, we use the term qualities, and a lot of people these days called even bet use an even better term elites because most of these uh, requirements end with elite or some somehow like that. So these are uh, these are the important requirements that need to be uh, heard when talking to stakeholders that are basis on a, of our architecture or other solution. But even if we, if we actually analyze that these, I don't, I don't know, it has to be fast, uh, convenient, secure, and stuff like that, this is still, still not enough. Most of uh, products and software projects fail because we don't have uh, the require the quality of the requirements is not good enough, so we can't validate uh, early enough, and the stakeholders are not customers are not uh, not satisfied and then they don't pay us and we fail so here it's not tom gilp it's lord kelvin who f maybe i i don't know these quotes are uh, everybody uses quotes these days but uh, most of the time from uh, albert einstein and uh, they say that he didn't say it but i think he, he uh, in this case he did if you don't measure something you cannot improve it so let me tell you what are the basic aspects of uh, quality requirements quality? The first, of, uh, first one, based on this quote, is quantification. Uh, quantification means that whatever requirement like this you use, be it usability, maintainability, security, needs to be quantified, that is, connected with some function, and then uh, measured or measurable, so that uh, you can actually improve it towards success, or uh, you can actually find out that, it, that you failed towards uh, the failure space. Uh, it happened to us, uh, like it happens all the time that the function is actually coded, but uh, some quality of it is so bad that you can, you can even say that the function is simply not there. Like we are doing printers and one of the functions we use there is uh, authentication. And uh, once we wrote authentication for a, for a printer, that took 20 seconds. It was in the code, all the service calls were there, but uh, from this perspective, the function was simply not there because nobody will wait for 10, 20 seconds for an answer to, uh, to authentication. So uh, the goal here is to stay at least in the tolerable part and to, uh, to improve uh, to success. Quant Quality quantification has two uh, important parts that usually don't get distinguished, which is also a problem, and that's scale, which is basically an abstract definition, uh, use usually in terms something per something somewhere, uh, units, some rate, and some conditions or, or context. I will show you an example on the next slide. And measures. Measure is basically the process or program or whatever that you use to, to, measure, uh, to measure it. This, also, uh, and this distinction also enables, for example, me to work with these things because I have no idea how to measure stuff uh, on the low level. But uh, I can still be able to, to define the scales based, based on what I hear from the stakeholders and the measures can be implemented by QA engineers or, or, or something like that. Uh, as an example, we have scalability, which is uh, carefully chosen because uh, one of the terms is scale, and this is this is a different thing. Uh, which can be one scale can be defined as average ratio number of failed transaction versus some some size of the system over a period of time. So I don't know, average timeouts over the number number of requests. Uh, in a, in a given day or something like that. Uh, this is also typical. The definition of the scale is abstract. There are some terms in, in, those, uh, in those brackets, which means that you, you should put there some, uh, some parameters or some terms that uh, fit to your situation or, or your product. So this is just an abstract definition. You can find it in a book. Uh, think about it, discuss it, uh, use some, some, some different uh, definition, but it's still, it's still usable. Uh, whereas the measurements, 
And this is from uh, Mark Richards, a great uh, architect and teacher of architecture from, uh, from the US. Uh, whereas the measurement can, for example, has th usually has three parts. You capture some low-level data, like crash, number of crashes, failed transactions, timeouts, and stuff like that. Then you store it into some database uh, in a way of, you know, you, you use aggregate numbers, uh, like totals, averages, stuff like that, and you also persist the information for future use. And then you can derive some measurements out of it. We, for example, use, uh, we don't use relational database there, uh, but we use uh, a system like that to, to, to measure some of our performance or other qualitative stuff, and there is uh, uh, influx DB, Grafana, stuff like that. But that's uh, too detailed for, for an architect. So uh, just to explain what I meant by the uh, ratio being important for scalability, if you have 1,000 users and 10 failures occur, uh, and then you measure the same thing for 10,000 users, and there are 12 failures, that's probably okay, because the number of failures stays logarithmic con constant, something like that. So you can probably grow the system even more without having too many failures just because the system grows. If you have 100 failures for 10,000 users, that can or may or may not be okay based on uh, how the system is designed, because that means that uh, when, you, when you grow the system in, in one order of magnitude, uh, you grow the number of failures in the same order of magnitude as well, so it depends. But if it's 1,000 failures, then the system doesn't scale, because pr there will be probably a point in the future when the uh, number of failures and the size of the system will intercept, and uh, that's basically, that would be uh, the, the border of the scalability. So I, I find this uh, definition of scalability really useful. Uh, another failure you can do when, uh, when analyzing uh, and trying to quantify uh, quality, quality requirements is that uh, you actually have a complex elity that you want to measure with only one scale and you don't analyze it well enough. This is a nice example of, uh, also from Tom Gilb. Uh, love is, some, uh, is a little bit like, uh, like value in the product because when you see it, you know that it is there, or he has another example of friendship, but it's quite, uh, quite difficult to simulate something or do something to ensure that love is there. But uh, he uses this example to, to, to show that you can have uh, a lot of simpler or uh, simpler requirements that, in its, uh, that can tell you uh, why the love probably is not there, like uh, lack of intimacy, no, fr no friendship, stuff like that. Uh, of course, uh, we use it uh, more in the technical uh, technical area. Uh, like I said, qualities like robustness, qualities like uh, maintainability, usability, uh, they will tell you, some people will tell you that those are not measurable. And uh, in this case, it's because there are too many aspects of them that are individually measurable, but you need to uh, you need to be able to analyze it into them and measure those, uh, those individual aspects. Otherwise, uh, you will lose something or you will uh, conclude that uh, the particular quality is not, uh, not actually measurable. Usability is a very nice example of this. Robustness as well. Uh, see what... what uh, it's not only fault prevention, uh, even testability or... Uh, system restore speed are, are important for robustness. And uh, in this case, you should really uh, measure, measure, measure all of these things. So this is what's important to have quality, uh, to have good quality requirements, quantif quantification, and proper analysis so that you can quantify them uh, more, uh, more effectively. The third important thing is that uh, no solution is actually uh, good or bad. Uh, no architecture or design is the best that was ever found and should be used for, uh, for every situation. 
so the third aspect that is important to keep in mind is that it's all about trade-offs. This is a nice example I use when explaining this. Uh, this is basically data communication. We have some sort of Ethernet or other, uh, other technology like this, which has uh, quite low latency uh, and okay bandwidth for most of, the, most of the cases. And then we have something called sneakernet, which is that you just put uh, hard drives uh, in a track and, uh, and uh, in a truck and drive them somewhere. Uh, this quote has been attributed to several people during the time, and it's probably thought as a joke. But we all remember one example when the trade-off actually paid off, and that's this, uh, uh, this picture of, of a black hole, where uh, they actually used planes to move all the hard drives with the data uh, that was gathered on, on several, several places uh, around the world. And then uh, it took them about two years to put it all together to get this one picture. And it's okay. It's, uh, it was one of the great scientific discoveries of, uh, of, of this century uh, because uh, nobody needs uh, you know, a YouTube live stream of, of a black hole. And also the, the latency is already 54 millions of years. So here it's okay. So even uh, there are even situations when uh, this such extreme trade-offs uh, can be uh, can be worth doing. Uh, this is another example from Mark Richards, where uh, if you if you if you take uh, abstract architectural patterns like monolith, microkernel, microservices, and use different uh, elities, uh, here we have cost is cost costability probably performance simplicity and agility, you can see that some of them are strong in some areas for some qualities and uh, quite weak uh, for, for, uh, for others. So if you want uh, high agility and you don't care about the cost, and I think we can argue about this uh, quite a long time, but it's, uh, it's an example, you don't care about simplicity and cost, you can use microservices. If you just want a simple application, that's not agile at all. You can't, uh, you can't evolve it in any way. Uh, but uh, you, are, you, you don't have much money and you want something really simple, just use the monolith. Don't, uh, so microservice is not even, uh, I think the best here on this, oh, God, what happened? It's event-driven architecture, but still not even the event-driven architecture is some silver bullet that will solve all your design problems. So this is trade-offs. Uh, you should usually always generate a lot of options to see uh, which trade-off you want to make, and nobody is uh, always clever about uh, about their designs. So uh, this was about uh, this was about requirements. Uh, just to uh, just to sum it up, requirements are functional and qualitative. Qualitative requirements are more important for architecture. Uh, because functions are basically for free. Uh, and it's important to be able to analyze and quantify quality re requirements and measure and do all your uh, decisions based on what you, uh, what you find out, not to create clever horses, clever hunses. And uh, there's usually more aspects than one to each of these decisions. So you should be, you should be aware that you have to do trade-offs and there is no great design that will uh, help everybody in every situation. So this is the third very important element uh, for me. Uh, that's uh, one of the reasons I, I'm, I'm an architect in the first place. And that is uh, I'm required to be always curious about uh, new technologies, new approaches, new, new things that our partners or competition are doing. And uh, that's what makes it uh, more fun. But there are some uh, traps here as well. There are actually two, tenden two extreme tendencies. One of them is that you just know your stuff and you don't want to, uh, or you even can't uh, do other stuff, use, uh, use different things, which is obviously bad. The other tendency is that you really need to do every new JavaScript framework, every new methodology, every, every new thing. And both of them are kind of uh, not, uh, 
not always ideal. So for the expertise trap, there's another story about this general whose name is Matthew Broderick and about, uh, about New Orleans. In New Orleans, this, there was this big hurricane, Katrina, and uh, Matthew Broderick was a, was a general in American uh, army who was uh, an expert on uh, who was an expert on uh, rescue operations, but he was a rescue. Uh, he was an expert on military rescue operations. So when they sent him to New Orleans to help all those civilians, uh, there were some there were some things uh, didn't even know some problems and things he didn't know, even know existed. So the whole operation from the government perspective was a was an utter failure even though this guy was really an expert. Why? There's something called Rumsfeld Matrix. You might have uh, seen it. Uh, that, uh, this is actually not, this is, uh, this is a, uh, you, you can call it a Rumsfeld Triangle. But the matrix has no knowns, known unknowns, unknown unknowns, and uh, known unknowns. Uh, so known knowns are facts, things that you know for sure and that you, that you can use uh, use easily. Non-unknowns are things that uh, you know that they exist, you know, but you don't know uh, too much detail about them and you can't use them fluently. And unknown unknowns, that's the dangerous part, that what broke the general's neck, uh, is something you don't, you don't even know exists. It's something uh, you have no way of uh, preparing for. You, it just... Uh, there are also known unknowns, unknown knowns, which can be thought as uh, intuition. It's something you know, and you don't no longer know that you, that you know about it. As an architect, being curious, uh, you should really work on the ratio between uh, the unknown knowns and unknown unknowns. So uh, what I do is, not that I uh, really learn every new technology in depth and try to be able to, to develop in new languages and stuff like that. I'm just learning about stuff that exists and that might be important to, uh, to learn in the future or that uh, some people around me know in depth and I just need to know that it exists and uh, need to be able to, you know, to add it to the designs or to, uh, to, to be able to discuss with them and to understand uh, trainings and, and stuff like that. What I do uh, is basically, uh, and you need to do it as an architect because you don't get to work on detailed stuff any longer so much, is to learn by random exploration. That is to go to conferences. And what I do is every morning with my coffee, I uh, look into some online uh, online uh, sources like InfoQ, DZone, uh, ThoughtWorks, Tech, Tech, TechRadar, or something like that, and just expose myself to random information because that's the only way to just to cross the boundary to unknown unknowns. I, I didn't know that those things existed. I need to uh, go there and, and because uh, if, you know, if you think you know everything about something, you are in this local optimum part, and the, even though there is some more, much more deep part, you have no way of knowing about it because uh, from, from your perspective, in your, uh, in, in your area, everything is uh, worse than what you already have. I even have my Wikipedia, that's from a book called Algorithms to Live By. Uh, my my uh, uh, internet browser set up so that uh, the home page is a random Wikipedia page. So I learn about all sorts of crazy stuff, uh, even though I don't need it, uh, because uh, it's really something random from all around the world, from all the knowledge that has been gathered. Another thing to be aware of is so-called Deming-Kruger effect. Uh, when you're learning something, especially in the unknown, unknown, uh, unknown unknowns area, uh, you tend to end up on this, uh, on this hill, it's called Mount Stupid there. Uh, where you have uh, quite, a you are very confident, comfortable with what you know, but your knowledge is very low, and there is no way of knowing, and you are even very much uh, afraid that someone will push you down the, down that slope because it's it's really painful. Uh, just a little bit further from the from the Mount Stupid, 
you think that you don't know anything, although your knowledge is actually uh, actually growing. So uh, be aware that uh, a lot of the times you don't even think that there is something more to learn, and this randomization is a great method to, to avoid this trap. Um, on the other hand, to catch uh, every new technology might not be a, such a good idea either, or every new uh, or, or, or all, all, all new uh, ideas, method, methods, and so on. Uh, one great thing is uh, so-called Lindy effect that says uh, that uh, the, it originated from uh, from Broadway actors who met in this uh, in this establishment called Lindy's on Manhattan. And they discussed how much the Broadway plays will be, how, how long more will, uh, they will be played uh, before ending. And they found out that on average, uh, if the play was uh, on the stage for, I don't know, five years, on average, you can be expect that it will be there on another five years. And the same thing uh, can be used for JavaScript frameworks, uh, tools, libraries, and, uh, and, and stuff like that. So uh, you can uh, quite easily predict the future, at least on average. Uh, this is a very, very nice thing to, uh, to watch for. It's, uh, I, I always use this uh, so you can find it very easily. It's a blog post called uh, Choose Boring Technology. And the Rumsfeld matrix is used there uh, again. Uh, and in this case, it's, uh, it's directed at people who like to use new technologies to solve, uh, let's say, new problems they find around their products uh, because they think they are more suitable or more fun to work with. But uh, the author has, gr has nice arguments to show that uh, it's just because there are unknown unknowns about the new technologies you simply don't know. So uh, you will hate it later. And you hate the one you are, you are using now because uh, you already the unknown unknown space is small so you already know all the things to ha hate it for. There are some other arguments in this article and I really recommend, it, recommend to, to read it. And the last, I have two minutes, 19 seconds. So uh, the last thing uh, is uh, another talk I would really recommend by uh, Robert Levkovitz. It's a guy who does talks about software architecture and stuff around it. And uh, he uses a method of provocative statements. So he says something and everybody's angry at him uh, at the conference, but then he explains. And uh, it's usually some very interesting food for thought. Here it's, uh, uh, he has a talk about uh, technical debt. And he says, what we usually call technical debt is just bad design and we should do something about it. The real technical debt is all those dependencies we borrow for our software. He says, uh, you have a, your hiring process is probably very tough, uh, and you, you won't allow anybody to write something to your software, but you easily take a GitHub uh, library written by someone, and not even looking at the code, should uh, put it into your pr product, or you use JSON or something, and 50 million bytes of, uh, of, of weird code gets included with, without, your, without your control. So um, we had, for example, so he says there are some dependencies that you need to use. Uh, he calls them uh, sediment, like uh, Java, uh, uh, the operating system services and stuff like that. You should really take good care of them and uh, manage them properly. We, uh, it took us uh, lately four months just to upgrade Java from 8 to 11 because we were not careful enough and you should just uh, ditch the rest. Uh, you can always uh, use something simpler than those. Uh, usually every, each library you use uh, does a lot more than you need, so uh, you should probably be very careful about that. At least be very, uh, there, are, there are security vulnerabilities, stuff like that. At least be very careful about what you use. And just like, as, like I predicted, Leadership is something you have to talk me uh, about with about talk with me about at our stand, but I will probably give you all the slides. So 
you can read, read them for, for yourself. So uh, I don't have more time, but there is a slide with all those, with all those, come on, very interesting, all this stuff, uh, with all those people I cited. Uh, and I really recommend not remembering anything from my talk and just starting following these people. And you will learn all of these things for yourself. Uh, so that would be it. Thank you for your attention.